Thank you very much for the introduction and welcome everyone to my talk about serving Ruby with Sag JavaScript. If you're a Ruby developer, this is an uh, introduction to your GitHub actions and using JavaScript from a Ruby point of view. Anything I say in this current presentation could not influence your decision to invest in new relic. So the safe public slide to let you know that. And my name is Michael Lane. I'm a senior software engineer at New Relic, and I work in the Ruby agent team. And I, I am currently a maintainer of what is now an open source project for the New Relic for the Ruby agent. And I'm also an open source contributor to many projects, and I'm a party guard because I do Ruby, and I'm now doing JavaScript. I've done probably 15, 20, 30 languages over the years <laughs> I've lost count. I'm a father, husband, a tennis player, a volleyball player, and I do trial running and cooking and anything I'm not programming, that's, that's where I'm at. <laughs> and over the course of my career, which is three decades at this point, I've been an entrepreneur, a consultant, specializing in Ruby on Rails and upgrading from, from round one and two to three, all the way up to four and five. Uh, then CIO of America Building Company, uh, director of IT, a uh, clinical research system builder, all using Ruby up to this point. By the time I get to the University of Georgia, I was a uh, system administration running the system that runs the hospitals in the vet, at the vet school. And many, many languages, many databases, <laughs> Too much to do. And in last but not least, I am almost deaf and with a profound, severe, profound hearing loss, which means without hearing aids, I pretty much hear nothing. <laughs> and I'm a lip reader. This story I'm going to tell you about is about bringing Ruby, the Ruby agent, into the open source arena and going from closed source, closed available to open source. In prior to open sourcing, we were running everything on Travis continuous integration in our internal system. We had Travis Enterprise. And it's not, per, not Ruby per se, it's just a Ruby view on running JavaScript. So you're going to see a lot more JavaScript than Ruby in this, this presentation. I'm going to show you why we chose GitHub Actions and JavaScript over the alternative available. And then I will show you some examples of how we solve various issues along the way. And some of those solutions might be completely surprising to some of us that are turning Ruby all the time. So uh, the Ruby, the new Alert Ruby agent, what is that? That is a Ruby germ for those of you who are not Ruby in nature. And it's just a practice library of related functionality. And this agent is added into your application. You, you typically a Rails application and it traces your model view controllers, trace stack, your middleware, all that. And it tracks in timing, got the timing and memory usage and heap allocation, garbage collection, and other application performance data. And it sends them all up to the cloud to new app, where the cut where you can then see all that graphed out and see usage patterns and any kind of outliers, anything like that, that would be interested in debugging and figuring out how to make your application faster and more performant. And so um, what they present for us is that because we've had this Ruby on Rails, this Ruby agent for so many years, we have a lot of customers that are still on Rails 3 and 4, which are also on older versions of Ruby. You, you cannot move Rails and run it on newer versions of Ruby very easily. And so we have to support all the way back to Ruby 2.0. So 2.0, 1.0, how the way 2.7, and now with 3.0 coming out at Christmas, we'll be on Ruby 3.0 as well. Which means, by definition, our test matrix is very, very large because we have a lot of instrumentation that go along with all those movies. And that includes um, the database integration, the rails integration, the, the backend jobs integration, all of that. Yeah, our matrix, it grows in Travis, 
at the time that we were looking to move to get her passing, we noticed there was 157 total jars or containers all running in parallel. And we were burning 18 to 21 hours of CPU compute time for every single build. And that's between 1,000 and 1,300 megabits per build. And if you see where I'm going with this, you can get some action. The account only runs 10 jobs at a time, not the 157 jobs or 152 jobs. So we're kind of looking at this and go, oh no, what are we going to do? Because that translates into two and a half hours if we just put it exactly what we did in Travis straight to get him out and run it that way. And let me tell you, 30 minutes already painful, so two and a half hours, that would be just completely excruciating for us. <laughs> so what are we going to do? That's what we're going to talk about here. <laughs> We wanted to use pre-built Ruby, but it was a problem. Ruby 2 are on 2.4 at end of life. Meanwhile, OpenSSL 1.1 came out after Ruby 2.4, which was end of life as well. Yeah. OpenSSL 1.0 was end of life. And Ruby from 2.4 and earlier did not compile and run under OpenSSL 1.1. They need 1.0. And that's because the OpenSSL 1.1 API changed just enough from 1.0 that the end of life Ruby no longer compile against that latest version. And so the first thing we did was look at all the GitHub actions that are out there that actually build and run Ruby. And one of the most well-maintained one comes from Ruby slash setup Ruby. And what we discovered is that even their old Ruby gems are broken, at least from our point of view. So take a grain of thought on that not reflective on the quality of the work these guys are doing with the Ruby, set up Ruby. It just, uh, it didn't work for us at the and we didn't know why. And it was becoming a rabbit hole to dig in and try to figure out all that. And the first hurdle we have to do is figure out how we're going to support all the Ruby. And that was something we needed to solve first and that was where we put all our focus at the beginning. And just to show you an example of what we were running into with the OpenSSL library, this is an example of OpenSSL calling out an undefined symbol SSL version 2 method, which is just basically the difference that we are talking about with the APIs. And this is another example where it wasn't necessarily the OpenSSL library itself, but we were calling, we were kind of Powering Ruby native gem that will link to the old version or the new version of OpenSSL and then colliding with the, the old version of 1.0. So that's what we were juggling with both the system level stuff and the Ruby gem that compiled negatively. So, way exactly it's broken. We knew we had a problem with OpenSSL, but we didn't know why. And, you know, we thought, well, maybe it's the path if we got the right version to open the cell and the right version in the path, maybe that was it. Or uh, the Ruby was built incorrectly, you were making to get the wrong SSL version in the library. We didn't know for sure. Or uh, it could be that we were not correctly passing the open SSL parameters into the Ruby gem, so they were building incorrectly. Again, we, we were, it was a mystery for us, and we were trying to make sense of these errors that we were coming across and trying to understand what it is. And of course, the last possibility is the OpenSSL was interfering with itself because we had two or more versions of it installed you know, it, it, during our experimentation trying to figure it out. So the first decision became, do we build Ruby ourselves or do we use the prepackage? And we made the decision to build it ourselves. And once we made that decision, we decided we had to figure out what's the most maintainable approach that we could use. And so the first choice we had was working with all the public projects to hopefully get the first choice we had was working with all the public projects and hopefully getting the older version supported correctly. The problem with that is not knowing how long it would take it to accomplish something like that because you have to collaborate and you have to collaborate, it just adds a lot of time. And we were under the gun to get this done in 30 days or less. So, because we were also new to the scene, we also had no influence or any clout whatsoever in any of these individual projects. 
and you know, you're all probably coming in, it could probably be willing to wait and get things going fast, but we didn't know, we didn't know how long. And even if we were able to get in and make some changes quickly, we knew and recognized that there's a steep learning curve to each one of these projects to figure out how they're structured, to figure out who, who are the movers and shakers for a new project and get things moving forward. So that gave us choice number two, which is to become experts in building Ruby ourselves. In the time to accomplish that was relatively known because we build Ruby. We, we built it in the Travis VR, so we know how to build Ruby. And we would have full control of our environment. And by that, I mean, we could set up anything, we can compile anything, we can set all the environment variables, whatever we need to do. And there far less to learn to automate, simply because we already had a working continuous integration solution in Travis. Now, the decision we chose was to become the experts ourselves to build an old Ruby. And it turned out to be the right decision because we we're in complete control of our CI environment and we're not beholden to you. We are the maintainers of Ruby build action. So we didn't have to worry about them breaking things or us breaking their system or any, any kind of cross issues going on there. Once our environment is built and set up and codified, that's it, it stays where it is. And we could fit both system level issues as well as Ruby compile issues. So whether we have to fit the system level, or we have to fit the gem level, or we have to fit the libraries, and so we have complete control. So that's what made this choice or this trial a good decision for us. And then our knowledge becomes 100% codified in our continuous integration process and scripts that we have set up and used. Uh, if you're familiar at all with GitHub Action, there's basically three ways you can set things up. You can set up a Docker run image, run all your actions in the container. You can set up you can do everything in the workflow, including all the bash scripting and everything you need, or you can write action scripts, which in this case would be JavaScript for us. And our, our natural inclination with the writer is low code is absolutely possible. And of course, we're looking at JavaScript and say, well, we're Ruby developers. We're Ruby developers and not really keen on learning JavaScript just to do something like this. But being able to set up a Docker file, which is already, we already had copies and examples of from Travis containers that run, we thought this might be the easiest way to go. So we can use the old Ubuntu images, images to run the old Ruby, we can use the new one to run the new one. Simple enough. <laughs> and you pick up the right version, open SSL, and both environments. Very easily. The challenge was how do you build and cache and reuse? Because if you don't cache them, you're going to be rebuilding the Docker images over and over and over, and that just adds a lot to the continuous integration time. And we were noticing that most of the projects that are using Docker containers also built their Docker containers with a separate repository. We didn't know if that was a word requirement or if we would need to replicate that, but it seemed like it was the right way to go because you don't want to change in your project messing with your Docker image. We're having to build a Docker image every time you you take a pull request in your project. <laughs> but then it comes, how do you drive that? And we discovered how to set up the Docker image. If we wanted to drive a different value, then in circumstances, you have to set up environment and pass them around. You have to set up an environment in your workflow, then you have to pass it into your script that the entry point to the Docker container. And then once you're inside the Docker container, you have to pick up those environment variables and do your conditional branching in there. So we're looking at Docker containers and bash scripts and workers, the workflow script, all that was becoming a maintenance tool that we didn't want to have to deal with. We didn't have to. And it also made everything in the workflow a lot less transparent what's going on because what happens inside that Docker container doesn't necessarily show up in your workflow, in the output in your workflow. So it was very, very limiting in transparency. Then we thought, well, how does it even work with port repositories and people making contribution to the to the, the code? You know, are they going to have the same pains we have? Or if they're making a change that is significant enough to require a new container, are they going to be able to set up the new container? We're, we're thinking, nope, not going to happen. <laughs> uh, 
And then the final issue we saw with uh, the GitHub actions installed that make it so convenient to use GitHub actions, they built some toolkits. And the toolkits are not automat automatically installed in these Docker containers. And secondly, we don't have all the tools we can use and play around with. And we have to build everything ourselves. So, <laughs> so this one, um, how do we control the Docker workflow effectively? This is everything I was just talking about. So I'm just going to summarize here. It's about setting the environment, and ensuring they're all met, and that of course begins the maintenance tool, and it's less transparent than running in the workflow, and you shut off and using the GitHub action tool to publish in, into the marketplace. And once we saw this negative, we said no Docker. That's not the way to do this. <laughs> the second attempt, we wanted to build it all in the workflow. And so this is kind of the traceable path. We said, let's just get something built end to end. Let's build it as fast as you can. And the workflow file provided that because you can run bash scripts in there. You can do conditional. But it turned out it doesn't exactly work when you're doing the conditional and you're trying to do a complex set of conditional. For whatever reason, it just doesn't work. It's quite only half the conditional work. <laughs> The first half and then the second half was thrown away and were ignored. So we don't know why, but we realized it was getting out of hand very quickly because as you can see, the long workflow expanding very quickly. So uh, what do you do about that? <laughs> well, that brings us to JavaScript. And the one thing we didn't want to do with Ruby developers because we didn't want to have to learn a new language, we didn't want to have to maintain things in a foreign language to us. But there is no Ruby toolkit. It's JavaScript and it's Go. But it turns out it's not all that bad. And as you can see from this example right here, it kind of reads like Ruby. You just have async and await and await thrown in there with some curly braces. <laughs> so I'm going to take you on this journey on this one. And complex logic becomes so much easier here. And you see, this is an example of where we're branching between the two different Ruby, the end of life versions of Ruby, and the current running versions of Ruby. And lucky for us, the current Ruby build script that builds all the Ruby that we use in that, in Langer, and the server deploy, and everywhere, is it the Ruby build script that gets embedded in the, the RB environment that can change Ruby? So uh, we wanted to leverage that. The problem was the end of life Ruby to actually maintain by another contributor outside this project who had branched it and embedded the open SSO that needed that successfully compile the old Ruby and run. And so we had the conditional branch to branch between the two. One thing we were very happy about with this approach is that JRuby also included. That was the bonus for us. We didn't have to have three stuff, <laughs> three different conditions to figure that out, or three different ways to build. Once we got the right library for building Ruby, everything else flowed in script. So that big long script workflow that I was showing you earlier got shrunk down. And a quick call, get the shrink right. And then we got four lines of code that basically implemented this big long workflow that we were building previously. So that was definitely a win for us. And that workflow, by taking a lot of the stuff out of the action, out of the workflow and putting it into the action, we're encapsulating it in a way that makes more sense and hides that from the workflow because this has absolutely nothing to do with the workflow itself. And this is another example where we're setting environment variables in order to make sure that Ruby runs directly within the runners. And we really liked it because we can actually comment on it. Why this variable is here, where we found the information about setting these variables and so on. It all gets encapsulated, it gets commented on, and we know what to do for a future self. And let me tell you, caching became a lot, becomes a lot easier because you don't have to jump out of the cache and make a cache hit every single stop that follows. And this is what this is showing us right here. It said on the left hand side in Big Four, we had an F condition on every single step. And then on the right hand side, we do it just once. We check it, if it's there, we return, if it's not there, and we go through and build it. Very simple. 
Yeah, like I say, welcome to the Promised Land. JavaScript does this weird thing. Each of us Ruby has to install async and await, and this is how they use it. You got async function, upgrade Ruby gem, and then somewhere in the gem you may call out to another async function. If you want to wait on it, you want to block on it, basically wait until it completes, you have to call it await before. And to resolve those promises, you use this construct called then. And you pass in the result of the, the promise into the then block, and then you can set your variable from there. And this is just a very simple example showing us getting the Ruby gem version from the environment and setting it into a string variable so that we can then do our computation from that. So here's what one of the tricky things for me. It took me two or three days to figure this out because it was my first exposure to async and with await and trying to figure out exactly what's going on with, with making a command call out to the environment and getting back a result. And it turns out that execute returns the exit code of the command and not the result, which is what Ruby do. And so the way you do this one is you set up some callback and that's what the options listen to callback. We divide the standard out and standard errors have their own callback and listen, and we can we concatenate the strings while it's running, and then we await the execute execute. And what that's going to do is make sure that the listeners fully populate before it returns anything, and then chomp output string just takes off in twelve new lines and so on. So we yeah, have just the string, and in our case, in the previous example, the version string for this gem. So now we're getting to the moment where writing the JavaScript actually becomes worth it. And that's what I'm going to take you through now. And back to our OpenSSL problem, where we have the version 1.0 and version 1.1 mismatch issue. This one was challenging because no, no two things were solved the same way as far as compiling Ruby. Uh, compiling the negative gems and strong gems that we use in OpenSSL but not negatively compiling. They were all very points that we had to set. The compiler files, the link directory files, the package config, the configure option, the OpenSSL directory, all those things <laughs> became challenging. If we were doing it in the workflow, it became, became a lot easier when we were doing it here in the JavaScript. And one in particular was the MySQL gem. It just would not pay attention to what we wanted, or that's to what we were filming at the time. So there's just something about this MySQL gem that just won't link up and use the right open SSL version. We were going way overboard trying to also pass in the width LD files and the width BPP files, in addition to the environment settings that were over and above. And we did know that they made a difference in how it compiled, but it didn't solve the problem. <laughs> And we finally did the one thing everybody told you not to do, you know, downgrade open SSL. Nobody wants to do that because that is a security risk and that is a security concern. And plus, so many other libraries in the operating system are also linked to their open SSL. So if you downgrade it, you run the risk of making a complete mess. And one comment who made not too long ago. <laughs> now, we're at it now, this is wrong. This is just going to break everything. We can't do that. And we kept hitting the head against the wall with the compiler files and everything. Finally, we just thought, you know what? We're just going to have to do it. And that's OK. And this is why it's OK. It's a build environment, it's a test environment. And it's not a production system that you have to maintain security long term. You don't have to harden this thing, keep it up and running in a production environment. What you need is an environment that you run your test against components that the customer actually has installed. And unfortunately, if we are running an old system, they're running with old components. And that's what we have to model. Or you won't be able to test it correctly. So the trade-off is now we can run everything in the modern operating system. And maintaining the build across the older version to also in the price. That, that's the two trade-off angles we will recognize. So we decided that if we just downgrade, we can run everything in the same container. That's one less variable to track and keep up with. 
Okay, so now that we made that decision, we realized the freedom to make a choice like that. We actually started thinking more outside the box. We were always thinking, are there other ways we could do this? And before that, we were completely blocked by, hey, you can't downgrade open SSL. If we can't downgrade anything. <laughs> this was a cartoon I really are because when I asked you to think outside that part, I forgot to ask you to think inside this one. <laughs> It kind of happens in our at this point. But it gives you the freedom, at least the better ideas, at least the thinking about the problem in more ways than you, you thought of before. And if we can't download OpenSSL, maybe we can download the specific component that gives us the problem, and that's what happened. We downloaded the MySQL current library, and lo and behold, that worked. We were very happy with that. <laughs> yeah, and flip back over to the JavaScript story. This is an example of how we downloaded MySQL. And this is a great example of how you can do something in parallel with JavaScript and then serialize what comes after. And remember, every async function returns a promise. So we collected the promise and then we resolve all promises. And then finally, we did a serial install from that. And that's how you can mix and match parallel and serial installs. And finally, we have all our Ruby from 2.0 to 2.7 in JRuby. And this is what it looks like for the build Ruby script. Very simple, very clean. And we can finally start working on our workflow. And looking at this workflow, we actually have two gems in one repository, the main Ruby agent gem, and a brand new gem called Infinite Tracing that does tail-based sampling. And that's a whole nother presentation. Uh, basically, two gems, one repository, and we're thinking two workflows for doing continuous integration. The main, the main continuous integration has to build auto Ruby, and it has to run the mini environment matrix, and it has to run the multiverse matrix. Infinite tracing continuous doesn't have to use auto Ruby. It only need 2.5 to 2.7 and on. But, if you had it all in one, in fact, one workflow, we knew that we can build all the Ruby's all the time. So we were kind of like, do we really need all of them? <laughs> Let's break it down into workflows and deal with that. And then that's what we were thinking. And here's one of the things we were thinking about what made us want to split it up. And that is the fact that the infinite tracing has some rare intermittent cells in our test suite that were just annoying enough that when they fail, we have to rerun the continuous integration. And we definitely didn't want to be sitting around for 30 minutes, 30 and 40 minutes for the whole thing to run if we didn't have to. Because the main continuous integration was about 30, 45 minutes, whereas the infinite tracing was about five minutes. So obviously, let's split it up. So when this one fell, we just kick it off and running again. <laughs> and that's what our thinking was. That's when you run into a problem we did not expect to. And that is when you run two workflows together and you then both run the build Ruby script and then both take off build Ruby 2.0 or build Ruby 2.5. When one gets ready to wipe the cache, the other tries to do the same thing. They, they bump in the other and they cancel each other out. So basically, you end up with errors in the suite and it never runs to completion. And GitHub actually is not far enough along where you could say in one workflow you need this workflow job to complete. So that was not an option for it. Otherwise, it would be very easy to say this workflow depends on this workflow and it becomes serialized by that nation. So we need to figure out how to solve this together. That's when we started thinking outside the box again. Remember, we're thinking with freedom now. And we said, okay, I bet we could probably retry these things. I figured out how to retry, and we just went and searched. And we found several retry gems. This was our, our favorite of them all because we could set a timeout and we could set the number of attempt, uh, attempts to try. Now, this minute, we can have one workflow and one retry strategy covering all the scenarios we were worried about. So if the infinite tracing one happens to fail, it just retries. And we solve a problem there. And now it's a resulting workflow, all in one file. Build Ruby at the top, 
we have, we see the main environment in Baltimore, we have build Ruby, and build Ruby at the knee, and it runs on the Ubuntu layers, so when we have one running environment, yeah, happy dance. And that led to the next thing, which is caching. You know, talk a little bit about this too, because almost all the documentation that you see for GitHub talked about caching in the workflow and not in a JavaScript bastion. And as you can see, I've got two places here in the green box where we're caching essentially. And that is with Ruby itself, and then with the bundle install, with the gem that are needed to run in the test. And this is why we wanted to move it out of the workflow and enter the cache. And you can see it, the same code on North Core DV, but it's the same code in pink, boom, 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 three times. By moving it out of the workflow into the JavaScript passion, we can eliminate all that code. And that's a big win. And one type of down near the bottom where the, the uh, cache key in version six and second version five, where it's the top two in version five. And that was the example of that made us realize, hey, we really need to dry this up because it's just getting too out of hand for it. And so what we have is the three blocks that you just saw in the before workflow. Very simple, use the cache, and then the cache key, and then restore key. They expand it out into a few methods in the JavaScript. Primarily to restore Ruby from cache and then save Ruby to cache. And we have one place to define the cache key. So we didn't have any more um, a thing getting out of whack with each other. And then you can use it precisely where you need to. When you're using the workflow, the caching starts at the point where you insert it. And then when you get done with the workflow, it collects all the files that are in the path and saves them. Here, we can actually control exactly when we do a restore and we control exactly when we cache it and save it. This also meant that we can have two caches, one for the Ruby itself and one for the bundle gem that we do. And this made it nice because we didn't have to build the entire matrix uh, Ruby and Gem together. We could build all the Ruby and hold them separate from all the, the gems that we needed to run our test environment. And our test could continue to evolve and change, but if the gems don't change, we didn't have to rebuild a bundle of gems. And that's what this is all about. And one of the interesting things about our project, and because it's a gem, you don't lock down the gem with the gem lock file. But all the examples we saw was showing you how to use gem, gem file dot lock, which, which is unique to itself, to make the hash key, the key hash. And what we do, we would build and install the gem, and then copy the gem file lock that was resulting from that into the place where we lock, where we save the cache, and then when we store, we copy the lock file back and then run bundle install and immediately run through and take using everything. It's a very fast install that way. So it saves a lot of time doing that. And this is a pro tip. Uh, caching is a lifesaver, but sometimes you gotta bust them. And each GitHub account gets five days of storage and then you cache it better in seven days. So you've got plenty of, plenty of storage and they, but they don't, they're still around for seven days until they're no longer used. So this is how you can bust that on them. Just put um, some version number on them and keep going. Okay. And if there's one last final tip on JavaScript on debugging in general, and that is to isolate, 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 and only run the small stuff you need to run and test. And this is an example where I was running and testing only multiverse. I didn't care about building Ruby over and over and over. It already had it built and already catching. So I was able to narrow it down and build only one or two specific multiverse tests that were always failing. And this greatly sped up the whole process. So keep that in mind as a way to speed things up. 
So we get down to the last bit, and it is what it was. That's what everyone wants to know. <laughs> so when we started, if we did not do the movie casting, we built it every single time, it would take about eight minutes to build each and every one of the Ruby version. So cash, by doing the caching of Rubies, we got it down to one minute and one second on average. <laughs> so that was definitely worth it. But still, every single continuous integration, you have to to um, restore that Ruby from cash and it's taken over a minute to do it. So, and we started looking at why they're taking a whole minute to restore a cache. It actually wasn't just restoring the cache. We were also restoring the entire environment. We were setting up the environment as though we were going to test. And we realized, hey, if you're just building, you don't need that entire test environment set up every time. All we need to do is see if we can restore the cache, which only takes about five seconds. So yeah, we, we got a major win there by doing that. Yeah, it's not just five seconds that's being saved. You're talking about when you're in the GitHub environment running these tests in parallel, it takes time to start up the process, it takes time to initialize everything. Sometimes that can drag on to one to three minutes just because the GitHub is lagging behind for some reason in their infrastructure. And the other times it's five seconds, it's, we're blazing through. The end result is the overall times of uh, is relative unchanged, 30, 35 to 40 minutes and on a good day when nobody else is using the 10, 10 containers that were allowed it, we can get it down to 20 minutes. Uh, you know, with everybody else in New York also using the GitHub action takes about 35 to 45 minutes, so there's very little change there. But, you have to remember, we're doing 10 jobs in parallel versus 152. So that's a huge change. And we now burn only 200 to 225 minutes in CPU compute time in every build. That is compared to 1,000 to 1,500, or about 577% reduction in compute CPU time 